Uh, thank you, Rob. All right, back at John 17. This is our great high priest, the Lord Jesus, and he's praying, interceding for his people here. This is our Lord's prayer. This is our Lord's prayer for his people. This is his heart toward his people. He said there in one of the verses, I speak these things that my joy may be fulfilled in them. He lets us hear his intercession for us. This is one of the ways he fulfills his joy in us. He prayed this in the hearing of his apostles, and he does so as recorded it for us to hear, because he's still interceding this way for his people. This is for his church. He's praying here particularly for his apostles, but this is so of all his people. Now this is what he prays in verse 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. You know, we live in a day when people are speaking of truth in a relative sense. That's, that's your truth. This is my truth. The only truth is God's truth. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes... I sanctify myself that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Our subject will be sanctified through the truth. And I don't want to preach about sanctification. I do not want to do that. I want to preach sanctification. I want to preach Christ who is our sanctification. The word sanctified is used throughout the scripture saints, sanctify, sanctified, sanctification. Sanctification is in Christ and it's by Christ. It's first of all to be set apart by God for God's use, set apart by God for God's use, no more to be used for common purposes. Where was this done? In eternity. God the Father set us apart in divine election and where? in Christ. Sanctification is in Christ. It's all by Christ. God the Father set us apart in Christ in election. You read that Jude 24. It's to be regarded and declared holy. You know God tells us to sanctify him in our hearts. We don't make him holy. We're regarding him as holy. Confessing he's holy. And this is what God does for us. This is by Christ's work for us. What he did for us on the cross, we see God's holy. This is how we see God is holy. By what Christ did. The reason he came, what he accomplished, sanctification is by Christ, it's for Christ, it's in Christ. And then it's to be made pure, it's to be made holy. And this is by being born of the Spirit of God. It's by Christ being formed in you. Christ who is our holiness, our sanctification. It's all in Christ and by Christ and through Christ. Sanctification is all of our triune God alone, by his grace, as is every other aspect of salvation. So nobody that's sanctified by God is going to glory that they sanctified themselves. Not true sanctified. Not, not if they're truly sanctified. They're not going to take a glory in being sanctified. Because God is the one who sanctified. To be truly sanctified is to know God in Christ is our sanctification. That's what it is to be truly sanctified. And to grow in grace and knowledge of Christ is to know this more and more. It's to know more and more Christ is our sanctification. So more and more all your confidence is Christ. This is what growth in grace really is. Now, I want to show you three things. How, first of all, how, sanctifi how sanctification begins in our experience of it. In our experience of it. Then secondly, the truth by which we're sanctified. And then thirdly, just a few words about sanctification. First of all, how does sanctification begin in a sinner's experience of it? How do we begin to experience sanctification? Well, 
It's by God's grace that we're sanctified by the Holy Spirit. It's by the Holy Spirit. It's by God's grace when we're regenerated. Now, we don't know what's taking place at that time, but what has happened is a new man has been created within us. In these bodies of sin and death, a new man's been created, a new spirit, by Christ being formed in us. Christ has entered in in spirit, and we've been made a partaker of the divine nature in that new man, Christ in you, the hope of glory. One with Christ. Now, Paul said in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 13, he said, We're bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to, sanctification, uh, to salvation. That's how we were sanctified in eternity. God chose us. But it was through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Sanctification of the Spirit, that's the new birth, and belief of the truth. That's where it begins. Whereunto he called you by our gospel, unto the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. The apostles had been sanctified in this way. They had experienced this sanctification. Christ said, I've given them thy word. He came to them, and he personally sanctified them through the word, through the Spirit. And when this begins we begin to learn right away. God right away begins to teach us something of God's holiness, something of how holy God is. This has everything to do with sanctification. He begins to teach us how holy God is. That's when God sanctifies us in our heart. He makes us see him holy. He makes us regard him as holy and declare him as holy. We see God's glory. We see his honor as being holy, being separate from sinful man, being separated from ourselves. And everything we thought was holiness, everything we thought that we were doing that made us holy goes out the window. When you see Christ and, and or God and see his holiness, how infinitely great in holiness he is, that's when you see your sin. He said in Numbers 20, 13, this is the water of Meribah because the children of Israel strove with the Lord and he was sanctified in them. He made them see himself. He, made him, he, made, he sanctified them in their heart by sanctifying himself in their heart and making them see him as holy, high, above all, separate, different from everybody. Holy, holy, holy God. That's what the angels cried. Remember when... When Isaiah was made to see the glory of the Lord, he heard the angels crying, the seraphim crying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God. They were covering their face. They were covering their feet. He's so holy. And it made Isaiah cry out and say, Woe is me. I'm undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. That's what a glimpse of God's holiness did for him. Made him see he was unholy. And God sanctified us within. Well, that's when we see God's holiness. We learn something of it. And that's when he begins to teach us that we must be perfect to have communion with holy God. Perfect. Absolutely perfect. God Almighty is holy and righteous and just and perfect. And if you're going to have, if he's going to have anything to do with us and have communion with us and accept us, we have to be holy, just, righteous, perfect before God. Or he cannot have anything to do with us. God requires perfection in righteous obedience to his law. Perfection. Perfection. Righteous obedience. Anything less will be damned. Anything less. God requires a perfect sacrifice for sin. Our sin has to be put away. Perfect sacrifice. Atonement's got to be made perfectly. God requires a perfect holy heart and perfect holy worship of him. That's what he requires. That's how holy he is. Perfect. And God accepts only that which is perfect. He said in Deuteronomy 18, 13, Thou shalt be perfect with the Lord thy God. 
He said in Leviticus 22, 21, Whosoever offereth a sacrifice of peace offerings unto the Lord to accomplish his vow, or a free will offering in beeves or sheep, it shall be perfect to be accepted. There shall be no blemish therein. Now, when God is, begins this work and makes us to see something of his holiness, and we begin to see how holy God is, and we start to see our sin. That's when we begin to realize we can't come to God as we are. We cannot come to God anything that is of us. It's an impossibility because we see he's everything we're not and we're everything he's not. He's perfectly holy and we're perfectly sinful. And that's when he begins to show us his grace and his love and his mercy and start revealing us something about his sanctifying grace in choosing us before this world was ever made. You might not see this at first, but he's going to start showing you this, and you're going to start seeing this is the only reason you were separated, the only reason he had mercy on you. Jude, 20, uh, Jude said, called us, Jude, he said, Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. Sanctified by the Father. This thing of making us holy began long before we ever experienced it. If it wouldn't have begun then, we would have never experienced it. It had to begin before we ever fell. God chose us in Christ. He distinguished, us, distinguished his people from all others in that he loved us, chose us in Christ, separated us in Christ, so that before him, by all his spiritual blessings being given us in Christ, before him, he looked at Christ, our surety, our covenant, our Savior, our Redeemer from eternity, so that before God, we were holy and without blame before him in love, in the Beloved. The Apostle Paul addressed the Corinthians. He said, Under the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them which are sanctified in Christ Jesus. That's been before the world was made. We learn this, and when we start seeing this is why God made us to be born again by his Spirit. He loved us long before this world was made. He called us out. He separated us. He created a new man within us. Why? Because he loved us from eternity. And you start to see, this had nothing to do with me. It had nothing to do with what I am or what I've done. This is according to God's grace. Now, the second thing and the most important thing you begin to see when he, when he really begins to sanctify us, this is the most important thing we begin to see right here. We begin to be taught that Christ is the truth. He is the word. He is our sanctification. Verse 17, he said, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is true. John began this letter, this gospel, by declaring Christ is the word. He's the word that was God. He's the word that was with God in the beginning, the word that was God. He is God. He was manifest in the flesh. He's the word. He's the wisdom of God from eternity. He made all things by him. And he was made flesh and dwelt among us. And Christ said plainly, he said, I am the truth. I am the truth. He's God's word. He's the truth. He's the truth. Now here Christ says that he sanctified his apostles and he sent them into the world just as the Father sanctified him and sent him into the world. He said in verse 18, As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. How was Christ sanctified and sent into the world? By the Father. He said back in John 10, 36, he said to the Pharisees, You say of him whom the Father has sanctified, set apart, and sent into the world, thou blasphemest, because I said I'm the Son of God. In eternal counsel before the worlds were made, God the Father sanctified Christ. He set him apart to be the Christ, his son, to come forth. And at the set time he sent him forth, he's the sent one. He sent his son into the world. That doesn't mean he made him holy. That means he set him apart. 
He sanctified him. He set him apart to be the Savior, to be the sanctifier of his people. And as the Christ, as the God-man, as the head of his people, as the substitute of his elect, for our sakes, Christ sanctified himself that he might be the truth by whom we are sanctified. He said in verse 19, For their sakes I sanctify myself that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Now Christ was holy, he was pure, he was without sin from the womb. So it doesn't mean that he made himself pure. That's not what he's saying. He'd been holy from the womb. But it means he separated himself for God's holy use to accomplish God's will. And he did it so that by his accomplished work, he might be the truth. He might be the word. He might be the gospel by which God sanctifies his people in our experience of sanctification. You get what I'm saying? You get what he's saying? Christ Jesus sanctified his whole person to be the offering to God. He sanctified himself to be the offering that would take away the sins of his people. To be the offering that would remove all our sins and put our sins away out of God's sight, out of the sight of the law and justice of God by the sacrifice of himself. That's what he mean, mean, means here. We were sanctified in him by God the Father and divine election. And by his one offering, by him sanctifying himself and going to that cross, the spotless lamb, bearing our sin, fulfilling the will of God, answering to God's justice on behalf of his people, he perfected his people. He sanctified his people by that offering. Perfected the elect, sanctified us by his one offering. That's the will of God the Father. It was our eternal and complete sanctification, making us pure, making us holy, making us just like God is. That was the will of God. And that's what Christ accomplished by his perfect oblation. That's the will Christ accomplished. Go over to Hebrews 10 and look at verse 10. Hebrews 10.10 10 says, he said he came to do the will of God, and it says, Hebrews 10.10, 10, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once. It says in verse 14, for by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Those the Father sanctified in divine election, gave to Christ, trusted to Christ, that's who Christ perfected forever by his one offering, them that are sanctified. And by that offering, he sanctified us. And so when God comes to you and me and he sanctifies us in regeneration and the Spirit of God enters in, he creates a new holy man within these sinful bodies of death when Christ is formed in us. That's what he does. It's a new man created by God in the righteousness and true holiness that Christ is, it's Christ's righteousness, and it's Christ in you that is the holiness. And that's when the Holy Spirit purges our conscience to stop trying to look at anything we've done as being our holiness, as being our sanctification. That's when, for the first time, you see Christ as your sanctification, and you come to God in Christ alone. He convinces us we've been made holy and righteous by Christ alone. It's the holiness and righteousness God has made us in Christ Jesus. That's when we're brought to confess Christ to be our only holiness, our only sanctification, our only righteousness. And that's when God declares his child and makes you know it, that you're holy and righteous in his son. That's, the, that's what Christ is saying here. Father, sanctify them through thy word. Thy word is true. I've sent them into the world. I've sanctified them. I've sent them into the world just like you sanctified me and sent me into the world. They're going to have to know who to preach. They're going to have to know who sanctification is. They're going to have to know who holiness is. They're going to have to know who righteousness is. So, Father, sanctify them through thy word, through thy truth. I have sanctified myself, Christ said, for their sakes that they might be sanctified through the truth. He is the truth. 
What he accomplished is the truth, is the word by which he sanctifies his people in our heart. Now, let's look at the few practical words here lastly. When is... <clears throat> When it's the word, when it's the truth of Christ himself by which we're born again, that's when we're taught our need of the gospel, our need of the gospel, the word that's preached. That's when we're taught our need of it. That's when we've experienced the power of the gospel to sanctify us, and it's by this word he keeps sanctifying us, and this is how we are made to only preach Christ and him crucified. This is how the gospel's made our one weapon right here. You keep experiencing this just like you did in the beginning. It was the hearing of Christ's faithfulness that sanctified you in the beginning. It's the hearing of Christ's faithfulness that keeps sanctifying you. And this is what makes you use this one weapon when you're speaking to brethren or when you're speaking to sinners without. You speak of Christ and him crucified. Christ prayed that this sanctifying knowledge be given his apostles because Christ was sending them forth to preach him. That's why he was sending them forth. And it's sanctifi sanctification by Christ the word that we learn to preach only Christ and him crucified. The Hebrew writer preached Christ. All through the Hebrew letter he's preaching Christ because the Hebrews were trying to go back to their vain conduct and go back to all the different offerings and all the silver and gold and all the different things they thought redeemed them and all the ceremonies and the law they were trying to go back to it and a Hebrew writer preached Christ 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 from beginning to end and he's telling them come out from the vain teaching of those who say sanctification and righteousness is by man's works come out from them that's what he's declaring throughout the whole Hebrew letter and look how he says this Hebrews 13 look what he says here Hebrews 13. What does he use to teach us this? Hebrews 13, 10. He said, We have an altar whereof they have no right to eat which serve the tabernacle. He's saying those that are still trying to come to God through the law by their works, by their self-sanctifying works, they can't come to this altar. You've got to be a sinner to come to this altar. You've got to have nothing good in you, nothing done by you, nothing that will please God to come to this altar and know that about yourself. Know that the altar is the one that's going to sanctify you. That's Christ. Look at this. For the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned without the camp. Wherefore Jesus also that he might sanctify the people with his own blood suffered without the gate. Let us go forth therefore unto him without the camp bearing his reproach. Let's go to him. Let's go to him. Same message as when he finds us a Gentile in our sin and, and, and loaded up with our sin. Come out. Come to Christ. Go to him, bearing the reproach. Your old friends are going to ridicule you. They're not going to have anything to do with you. Go to him. But here's the sad thing. When you go to Christ, you're going to have religious folks who's going to do the same thing to you because they say you're not holy enough because of your works. You go to Christ. He's his holiness. He's your separation. Christ and his accomplished work is the word. He's the truth. He's the incorruptible seed by which the Spirit birthed us in the first place and by which he continues to grow us. He's the word. He's the milk. He's the truth. He's the meat. He's everything. He's how we grow. And the result of this work is we look outside of ourselves to Christ alone. That's the result. We look outside of ourselves for holiness and for righteousness as well as we do for everything else we need. That's true sanctification. To be conformed to Christ, separated from this world, separated from our lusts, separated from all that would separate us from Christ. And he continues to keep us partaking of his holiness because he's God our Savior. He is our sanctifier and he's our sanctification. Look over at 1 Peter 1. After Peter exhorts us not to return to our vain lust and our ignorance, but to be holy, for God is holy. That's what he tells us. Look at the first thing Peter says when he talks about the vanity we were in. Verse 18, For as much as you know, you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received from your fathers. 
he said up there, he said, he said up there, uh, verse 14, as obedient children, not fasten yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance. Be holy. As he that called you is holy, so be you holy in all manner of conversation, because it's written, be you holy, for I'm holy. And he begins right here. Don't go back to the feigned conduct you received by your fathers, thinking you redeemed by silver and gold, by ceremony, by something you did. Same holds for holiness. Same holds for holiness. But with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world was manifest in these last times for you. Well, how do we believe in God? Who by him do believe in God. It's by him that you believe. He sanctified you. That raised him up from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope might be in God. Now watch this. Seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. How did we do that? Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. That word, Christ said, Sanctify them through thy word, through thy truth. He said, I've sanctified myself. I'm going to the cross to do this work so that I'll be the word that's preached. I'll be the truth that's preached by which they'll be born of the incorruptible seed and given a new life and a new heart and holiness by me. Why do we have to be, it has to be of God? Why does it have to be of Christ through his word? Because all flesh is grass. All the glory of man is the flower of grass. The grass withereth, the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word by which the gospel is preached to you. And it's by this same word, it's by the same truth of Christ, our holiness, our righteousness, that the Spirit continues to grow us in the grace and knowledge of Christ. Look here at verse, 1 Peter 2, verse 1. Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and evil speakers. What is that? That's everything the Pharisees were doing. I saying, stand over there. Don't come near me. I'm holier than you are. Lay all that aside. And as a baby, as a newborn babe, you remember whenever our Lord called that child and he picked that child up and he said, except you become as a little child, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. That's not what he said. He said, except you become as this little child. You know where that little child was? held by him that's what he's saying except you become held by Christ like a little baby resting in his arms and in his grip and in his embrace and he said now as newborn babies desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby if so be you've tasted the Lord is gracious it's Christ preaching the word he's the prophet priest and king. It's him preaching the word through the spirit, making it effectual in our hearts that he sanctifies us and that he grows us in this state of sanctification. Let me show you that in Hebrews 2. That's what Hebrews 2 is declaring. Not only is he the one that sanctified us at Calvary, he's the one, he interceded. God the Father does this, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. But Christ, we're told over and over, He's doing this. It's, it's, it's the Father uh, sending his Son to do this. Verse 11. He said, Both he that sanctifieth, Hebrews 2.11, Both he that sanctifieth, and they who are sanctified are of all of one, for which cause he's not ashamed to call them brethren. He's made us one in him. He's made us holy in him, and we're in him. He's the head, we're the members. What he is, we are. If the If the Roots holy, the lumps holy. And what he is, you are. Now watch this. Saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church, I will sing praise unto thee. This was the will of our Father. This was God's glory to sing the name of God to his brethren and teach us his name and make this word effectual in our hearts. He sanctified us and he's our sanctification. And he's going to keep us knowing this by this gospel. But, and then, let me ask you this now. By our falls, by our sin, this is, 
and by God's chastening us, even when that's the case, and keeping us sanctified in Christ, that's when we learn that those God sanctified never become unsanctified. Those that he's made holy never become unholy because our holiness is Christ. He'll make you know that when you fall and you see how unholy you are and how, how wretched a sinner you are, and yet he keeps you knowing Christ is your acceptance, your holiness, your sanctification, and he keeps you sanctified unto him. That's when he makes you know your sin don't make you unholy, it don't make you unsanctified. God's going to grow us more and more to sanctify God in our hearts. To see he's our holiness. We don't make God holy, but we regard him as holy. And this begins in a new birth, but it grows as God grows us in grace and knowledge of Christ. We're seeing him as our holiness. God is our holiness. God regards his people holy in Christ because he chose us and blessed us with all blessings in him. And God makes us cease looking on the outward appearance when we fall or when a brother falls. How does he do that? He, he, by continuing this work, sanctifies himself in our heart and makes us sanctify God ourselves in our own hearts and trust him to keep us. When you fall, that's what he does. Is it not? When you sin and the Lord comes to you and with this gospel makes you see that he's still your holiness and still your righteousness and he makes this word effectual in your heart. Does that not sanctify God in your heart? Do you not see him as your holiness and your righteousness and your all? Do you not? And that's what makes us continue to regard his people and our brethren as holy when, because when we've experienced this personally ourselves and experienced him keeping us and that he is our holiness and we didn't become unholy when we fell, that's how come you know when your brother fall, he ain't become unholy either. But if you're looking on things people do and what you do and what you don't do, when you do not do as you ought to do, you're going to lose every hope you have. You're going to lose all confidence you have because you're going to be trusting yourself and what you've done. You're going to be looking at your hand. And when your brother falls, you're going to be looking at what he did and say, he can't be a child of God. Look at him. That's not sanctification. God's going to keep showing you you're his and keep sanctifying his child in his heart to know you're his. And, and what you did or didn't do didn't make you holy or unholy. He's your holiness. He's your holiness. God sanctified Cornelius. He was a Gentile. And he's going to, show Peter, he's going to send Peter down there to preach to him. So God let down a sheep filled with all these beasts that were unclean under the law. And he said, Peter, rise, kill, and eat. Peter said, not so, Lord. I've never eaten anything unclean or common. The voice spake unto him again the second time. He said, What God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. Now, if you've experienced this in your heart, you're not going to be quick to call your brother unholy and unsanctified when he falls. Because God, God sanctified him. God sanctified him. The last, this long suffering, what is long suffering? It's suffering a long time. It's, it's, it has to come to the very last resort for one God sanctified for you to separate yourself from them. The last resort. That's long-suffering. You don't go there right off the bat. Why? If you've experienced it, you don't. <laughs> if you know what a vile wretch you are, you don't. We're either holy or we're not holy. When we're born again by our triune God, we're holy. Now, we grow in that state of holiness. But we're holy. We give thanks to the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. We're in his Son's kingdom. We're out of darkness into light. We're meet to enter into glory by what God's done. We don't become more holy. The corn plant's a corn plant in the seed, in the blade, in the ear, and when it's fully grown, it's still a corn plant. 
But our new man, which is born of incorruptible seed, created holy by God, does grow in the grace and knowledge of Christ. Growth is an ongoing work. Sanctification is a continual work. You're not getting more holy, but you are growing. And being sanctified by God and born again by the Spirit of God, every believer grows in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we're not growing more holy. We're growing in that state of holiness, in that in sanctification, learning how to possess our vessel in sanctification, but your possessing or not possessing is not your sanctification. That's not what makes you sanctified. God is. God is. From a baby to a young saint to a mature saint, God is your salvation. He's your sanctification. We're not growing more fit for heaven. Your sin nature is not getting less sinful. God made us meet in Christ in election, in a new birth, and by what Christ accomplished for us. Our fitness is Christ alone. The difference in God's true growth and in those who think they're growing more holy, the difference is the spirit. When you grow more holy, you're broken and contrite. You see yourself, the sinner, more and more. And you see Christ, you're all more and more. That's the difference. It's not a, it's not a matter of words. It's not a matter of, of uh, just, just words. That are, it's the spirit that's different. I do think I've put away some sins of my youth. But that's not my holiness. That's not my growth in grace. Not by the sins that I've put away. Unregenerate men stop sinning outwardly as they grow older because their bodies just get old and wore out. But that don't make them holy. But as the light of Christ shines, we see our sin nature more and more. And we see sins in thought and word and deed more and more. Even in our best deeds that others may see no sin in. So we don't boast in our sanctification. But what a blessing. When you're sanctified in and by Christ, you don't cease being holy and sanctified when you sin. That'll be a blessing to you when you fall. That might not be a blessing right now, but when you fall, that'll be a blessing to know you don't become unsanctified by your fall. And by God's keeping sanctifying grace, that makes you hate your sin more. It makes you hate your self-righteousness more. It makes you see Christ as everything more and more. Nothing we do and nothing we don't do changes this. This makes you love godliness. This makes you love holiness. This makes you know what true holiness is. Looking at him. Here's what it is. This is growth in grace right here. It's growing more and more in these three things right here. This is growth in the grace and knowledge of Christ to grow more in these three areas. Paul said, we're the circumcision which worship God in the spirit. You learn more and more the worship of God is in the spirit. Number two, we rejoice in Christ Jesus. You grow more and more to rejoice only in Christ. And number three, we have no confidence in the flesh. You grow more and more to have no confidence in you nor in your brethren. And that confidence in the flesh means you don't put confidence in them when they do good. And when they fall, you don't put confidence that you don't, that don't matter. You trust the Lord. And you know, he's going to keep your brethren. You pray for them. You try to speak the truth to them. Try to speak the gospel to them. Try to remind them. Remind them how many times you've fallen. And remind them how many times God's recovered you. Keep them looking to Christ. Keep helping them look to Christ. Law's not going to do that to them. You can whip them and give them a tongue lashing and be hard on them and, and whatever you want to do. That ain't going to do it. Judgment begets judgment. Flesh begets flesh. It's the Spirit of God working in his believer. But wherever sanctification is, there's going to be consecration of the heart that's going to increase. There's going to be a conformity to Christ in the heart and in the life that's going to increase. Commitment to Christ and his cause is going to increase. Love, devotion, confidence in, submission to Christ is going to increase. Love to brethren, forgiveness, long-suffering, patience, mercy, that's going to increase. But in all of this, none of that 
you're going to look at and put any confidence in. In all of it, you're going to have a growing, utter lack of confidence in you and anything you do. It's the nature of God shining the light. He must increase, I must decrease. But it's this continual growth, Romans 12, it's this continual growth, his mercies constantly, his mercies constantly. When you see you sin more, you see his mercies more. And it's these mercies and his continual forgiveness in spite of us when we fall and sin and him continue to making us to see Christ as our holiness, these are the mercies that motivate us. And so Paul says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. That, that speaks clearly, brethren, <laughs> of our sin. Mercies of God. That you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. Not to make yourself holy and acceptable unto God, because you are holy and acceptable unto God. Present them a living sacrifice, which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's what I've been trying to say. This whole work is renewing you to think all new in what it, all this really is. That you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say through the grace given to me to every man that's among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Amen. All right, Brother Greg.